I have spent the last two weeks trawling through all the available internet archived information on Brandon Sanderson, particularly in his early debut years before he was selected to complete the Wheel of Time to try and figure out what is it? What is the secret that enabled Brandon Sanderson, a normal human being, to become Brandon Sanderson, the multiple New York Times best-selling, genre-defining, Kickstarter record-breaking author and creator and phenomenon that he is today. Because if I could crack that secret, then maybe I could become the next Brandon Sanderson. Here's what I found. Hey, it's Deborah with another video on the business side of publishing. When I set out to answer the question of how Brandon Sanderson became Brandon Sanderson, I did not anticipate that this would be the most difficult video that I have ever tried to make. Pretty much in every discussion that you find on the internet, people say that Brandon Sanderson is unique and they'll give a hundred reasons as to why. When I really looked at them and thought about what they actually were analyzing, all of these answers seem to be examining superficial elements of what Sanderson is doing. I wanted to find something that didn't sound completely trite, so I thought I would try to take a stab at a more substantial analysis. Sanderson has told the story of his journey as an author many, many times. At that point, I had written 12 novels. I kept sending them out to publishers, and they just were rejecting me right and left. My dad would call and be like, son, your mother's really worried. <laughs> And I kind of had to ask myself, what does my success look like? If I died with like, you know, 150 unpublished manuscripts, was I going to keep doing this? Even if I knew I would never get published and I realized, yeah, I would. Maybe I wouldn't go at the rate I was going, right? I would have to find a real job, but I was going to keep telling my stories. And that took a big weight off of my shoulders. And how he sold his first novel. Like within a month of finishing that is when Moshe read through his back list of books that people had sent him, including one I'd sent him two years earlier, which was Elantris. He never looked at it. He read it in the night. He called me manic and said, I want to buy your book. <laughs> like, and actually what happened is, is he called me and I, I'd moved since then and gotten a new phone number. And I sent to anyone who actively had one of my books on submission. I'm like, this is my new contact info. But he'd had it for two years. I figured I was never seeing it. So I finished this big beast of a book and then I sell Elantris. I'm like, great, now I don't know what to do. And so my editor's like, oh, what are you working on now? I want to see that too. And I send him Way of Kings. And he's like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this isn't the sort of thing that new authors usually publish. <laughs> Can we split it? And I said, no, you split the book and it's, it's, a, it's a really bad book because you have all the build up, but none of the payoff. And he's like, ah, oh. <laughs> like, that's all right. I've got this idea for Miss Bourne. And how Harriet McDougal picked him out of all the other authors she could have chosen to finish her husband's masterpiece, The Wheel of Time. I did not apply to finish The Wheel of Time. I got a phone call out of the blue one day from Robert Jordan's widow. And what she said was, I was wondering if you would be willing to finish my husband's series. I was not expecting this at all. So I replied, ah. <laughs> That night, I wrote her an email that said, Dear Harriet, I promise I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I was just so surprised, but I was also extremely honored. Uh, she asked me because she knew I had read all the books since I was a young man. And on the surface, it feels like one of those feel-good personality Time Magazine type interview pieces, or maybe the plot to a Hollywood film, or even the publishing equivalent of a fairy tale story where a young, unknown author toiling in obscurity gets a series of lucky breaks and becomes world famous. That impression is what comes across in a soundbite, but it really doesn't hold together once you start digging further into the details. After about 10 attempts across 7 days to try and structure my thoughts into some sort of coherent order, I started with the obvious, looking at what he writes and how he publishes. And what's interesting about his books is Brandon Sanderson specifically does not follow the advice of writing to market. I was getting rejection letters for things like Elantris and Dragon Steel, which I was really confident in. Your books are too long and your books are, are not, um, not market friendly in that, you know, the word, world's are too weird. They wanted gritty and they wanted low magic and they wanted earth-like. The shorter versions of George is basically what they wanted. So finally, against 
better advice of everybody, I sat down and said, all right, I'll try something like that. Um, and you guys do not want to read Brandon Sanderson trying to be George R. R. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> it was embarrassing. At the end of them, I'm like, I can't do this. These, these books are crap. I shouldn't be getting worse as a writer um, the more books I write. And I finally just said, you know what? Screw it, I'm gonna write the biggest, baddest, most awesome book that I can. Uh, they say they're too short, this one's gonna be twice as long. <laughs> they say that the worlds are too weird, I'm gonna do the weirdest world that I've always wanted to do. I'm gonna write the type of fantasy book that nobody's writing that I wish they would write. Um, and I'm gonna break all these rules that they say, oh, don't put flashbacks. Screw you, I'm gonna put flashbacks in every book. Uh, they say don't do prologues. Screw you, I'm doing three prologues. <laughs> Um, I did all the stuff they told me not to do because I just wanted to make the biggest, most coolest, baddest epic I could. And I finished this book, which was basically me flipping the bird to the entire publishing industry. When you look at the intersection between who Brandon Sanderson is and the kinds of stories that he tells, you really get his books. And every single one of his books has very particular characteristics that any Sanderson fan will recognize a mile away. When Sanderson got the call to complete The Wheel of Time, the only books he had out were Mistborn, the original trilogy, and a few of the Alcatraz books. And technically Warbreaker, but he was serializing that online by his own website and his fan forums, and so that kind of doesn't really count per se. Elantris was a standalone novel, but Mistborn was an entire epic fantasy trilogy. In Elantris, you can already see the hallmarks of the Brandon Sanderson reader experience. A high magic system, a character-driven story that relies on solving a puzzle that requires knowledge of the high magic system in order to get to the solution, a good twist that is well foreshadowed, and the trademark Sandalanche. And this one really took the early characteristics of a Sansa novel that were present in Elantris and just raised them all to the next level. There were more magic systems, the magic systems were interacting together, the character-driven plot puzzles got more intricate and relied on more foreshadowing, not just within the text of the novels themselves, but also in things like the epigraphs. Who he is has also influenced how he approaches publishing. He often talks about his mother who was an accountant and she is definitely one of, if not the main reason, that Brandon Sanderson approaches everything with a CEO's mindset, even though he has the heart and soul of an artist and craftsman. But I soon realized that looking at those things didn't really explain enough of his success. When you step back and look at the big picture of his author journey, it doesn't sound all that different to many other authors. And the more I dug through internet archives, the more I became convinced that Brandon Sanderson has not and is not doing anything all that different to other authors. He wasn't born as some sort of genius who could churn out first drafts that were publication ready. Despite all appearances, he does not actually write particularly fast. And if you look at Brandon Sanderson's sales funnel, it is the exact same sales funnel that every single other author out there uses. And while many people do love his books and he is always working on improving his craft as a writer, his books are not necessarily the best written books out there either. And while he does have a massive following, the way he went about building his author platform is not all that different. There's just so many angles that I could approach this question from. I've been rambling for about three hours now and I'm about to run out of battery, so I'm gonna have to keep filming this tomorrow. The earliest instance of Sanderson's author platform in terms of an online presence is actually the Time Wasters Guide. Online magazine and discussion forum that was started by a group of people at BYU, Sanderson included, who had been previously involved with the Leading Edge magazine at BYU. Prior to the release of Elantris, a lot of the people who were reading his work were just people who he knew personally or through his connections at BYU. Like every author out there, he started small with the very basics. As he was preparing for the release of Elantris, he started his website and blog and then expanded his platform over time. He's not the only author out there operating with a CEO mindset who has built his own publishing company. A lot of people point to Dragonsteel Entertainment and Dragonsteel Books as an example of why people can't be like Brandon Sanderson. But I, that just confuses me so much because I'm just like, this is not some mystical feat that is only possible because Brandon Sanderson is who he is. This is possible because Brandon Sanderson put in the work over 20 years to actually build this company up from scratch. I'm not trying to underplay the capabilities that Dragonsteel Entertainment has at all. His Kickstarter is very different from a lot of the previous record holding Kickstarters because it was not a viral kind of crowdfunding project that has happened in the past. 
It's a mid-sized press looking to launch a new product line and test a new business model by launching on Kickstarter instead of using conventional distribution channels in order to de-risk their expansion. There are other authors out there who run their own publishing businesses like Will Wyatt or Michael Angelay. And in fact, Michael Angelay probably takes things to the next level. So when I hear authors complain that like, oh, I just want to write books. I don't actually want to run a business or anything like that. And then they also simultaneously complain about people like Brandon Sanderson being able to pull the Kickstarter numbers that he can. And also the fact that traditional publishing means you have to give up a lot of your control and a lot of the remuneration in terms of settling for lower royalty rates and things like that. I'm just like, you can't have it both ways. Like you either put in the work like Brandon Sanderson has done and start your own publishing business, run it properly like the CEO that you are if you are a self-published author, or if you don't want to, then okay. And if that's the case, then fine, go and pursue traditional publishing where they will handle all of the business side for you. That's fine. But I do think these people should acknowledge that they cannot achieve this result because they are not willing to put in the work. He started a publishing business. When you self-publish, you start a publishing business. That is literally what you do when you are a self-published author. You are both the author and the publisher and publishing is a business. So <laughs> I'm just like, I, I don't understand how this is confusing for anybody. It is past 12 o'clock on Thursday and I need to go pick up my daughter from school in a couple of hours and I still have no idea how to finish filming this video for you guys. And while his books have a very well-defined brand and reader experience, that alone I don't think is sufficient to explain why he is so successful. And this made no sense to me whatsoever. Brandon Sanderson is achieving a unique level of success. That's what all the evidence points to. Therefore, there had to be some sort of unique factor or set of factors that was the causation behind this unique level of success. Something that he was doing that nobody else out there was doing. But despite combing through 20 years of all the information that has ever been collected about Brandon Sanderson, I have no idea how Brandon Sanderson became Brandon Sanderson. I had to be coming at this question from the wrong angle. So I stopped trying to think like an author and started thinking like a reader. Why is it that I, as a reader, am more likely to pick up a book by Brandon Sanderson over another author? And there's a lot of reasons. I have never gotten to the end of a Sanderson book and felt like it was a waste of my time. His books are way easier to read and more accessible than literary fiction. And even though he sets some of those stories in very grim and brutal settings, there is an overall optimism to his work, which is great for when I want a little bit of escapism, but I want to pretend that, you know, I'm an intelligent, mature person and I read serious books. As a reader, I have a lot of fun reading a Brandon Sanderson book, but I don't have to feel guilty that I'm reading his books because he's put so much care into crafting the stories that there's actually reread value. So you can't really define it as a trashy read. If I look beyond the surface level characteristics of a Brandon Sanderson novel, you end up with a story that has a reasonable amount of substance but it is not heavy because when it explores serious topics like depression and mental health and religion and things like that it always does it from the perspective of the characters in the story rather than necessarily with any overarching thematic statement. His books make you think but not in the same way that more serious works do. The kind of questions I usually have when I read a Sanderson book is, oh my goodness, how are these characters going to solve their problems using what they understand of the magic system and what I understand of the magic system and can I figure it out before the characters actually do and feel smart about it as opposed to reading a more serious work that really tries to explore the nuances of a deeper issue and makes me question my worldview and my identity. It's not that I don't like to read those kinds of books as well. I just don't want to read them nine times out of 10 during the week when I'm exhausted from work and parenting. Every Sanderson book is like a puzzle. There is always some sort of unsolved mystery or some sort of unknown about the magic system that is going to prove integral to everything. And so when you get to the end of a Sanderson book, there's just so much theorizing to be done to tide you over until the next book comes out. 
And they don't tend to be simple puzzles either. There are the kind of puzzles where based on the clues and the foreshadowing that's been given in the books, you can come up with multiple competing theories to debate and discuss during the time that you're waiting for the next book. And that has been a large part of why his fan community has been so engaged. And it was really the Mistborn novels that really pulled his readers together into a cohesive fan community. They would finish Mistborn, they would go and try to find out more about Brandon Sanson, they would come across his website, and then they would see that there was a fan forum, they'd go into the fan forum and they would start posting in there about one of two things. Either it was, I love your books, it's such a fresh take on fantasy, I have not come across anything that was this addictive and this satisfying, or they had fan theories that they wanted to discuss. It is now the third day of trying to film this video and I, 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 I just don't know where this video is going anymore. I could not find whatever this unique factor was. I still couldn't really answer the question of why he had become so successful where other authors working in the same genre with arguably better written books and doing very similar things were still struggling to secure a fraction of his success. And so I was forced to conclude that maybe everybody else is right. Maybe Brandon Sanderson is only successful because he is Brandon Sanderson. Wait, wait a minute. Brandon Sanson is successful because he's Brandon Sanson. I was going about this all wrong. Instead of looking at the mechanics of what Brandon Sanson did, I needed to look past that to the substance of what he was doing and why. Once I started doing that, the secret behind his success became clear almost immediately. There is no difference between Brandon Sanson the person and Brandon Sanson the author and Brandon Sanson, the brand. Being an author is kind of one of those situations where you end up, um, for better or for worse, tying everything that you do and your creative output to your own personal brand. It's just kind of unavoidable. And I think it will actually be really interesting to see what Brandon Sanderson does in terms of succession planning because so much of the value of the Cosmere and Dragonsteel Entertainment, it's all resting on Brandon Sanderson, the brands. And I have no doubt that he is already thinking about this because Brandon Sanderson is an amazing CEO. In every instance of every aspect that I looked at, from what kind of stories he wrote to the way he interacted with readers on his fan forum, to his social media posts, his YouTube videos, email newsletters, blog updates. Every single time, Brandon Sanderson is unapologetically Brandon Sanderson. I woke up this morning to the most Sanderson video ever. You might be dealing with Brando Fandonitis. You're not alone. Millions around the world have succumbed to this disease. Good news, now there's Quadravola. Will it help? Probably not. Will it make your symptoms worse? Almost certainly, but you won't care. It is the most Brandon thing to do ever on top of the most Brandon thing to do for a Kickstarter. I, I just, I, I have no words. And that kind of authenticity, which pervades every single aspect of his books and his brand, is the whole reason why he has such an engaged readership. Readers who love Brandon Sanderson's books love them because his stories connect with them on a deep emotional level. And I think it's only possible because of how authentic he is in his writing. And it all comes back to the fact that when Sanderson writes a story, he writes it because he wants to recreate the same experience he had as a young reader falling in love with fantasy for the first time for all of his readers. And when you consider how that authenticity extends to every aspect of his interactions with his readers, whether it be in a one-on-one -on -one context or on massive scales like conventions, for example, you can understand how he is able to build such a massive following because it makes for very powerful parasocial relationships. Which, you know, great for Brandon Sanderson, but what does it actually mean for us? Here's the takeaway. Are you ready for it? Are, are you? The takeaway is be yourself. <laughs> I can't even say that without wanting to roll my eyes. It is exactly the kind of takeaway and feedback that I absolutely hate because it is it, it's not quantifiable. What, what, is, what does be yourself mean anyway? And if you're thinking about clicking away from this video, 
I don't blame you because I hate this advice as well. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there is no other explanation for Sanderson's success. If you look across Brandon's 20 year journey as an author, you'll see there are a few definitive points. Discovering Dragon's Bane as a reader. The, the book that got me into science fiction and fantasy was Dragon's Bane by Barbara Ham. You know, this story should on paper not have worked for me, but it was the most amazing thing I'd ever read in my life. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that a story could teach me about my mom in some ways better than living with her for 14 years because I was a stupid kid who wouldn't listen. Um, and assumed he had the answers. But when I saw through someone else's eyes, who was very different from myself, that changed the way I saw the world. Enrolling at BYU? I was a student at BYU from 94 to 2000. A professor at BYU who was a literature professor who liked science fiction started teaching a class on how to write science fiction fantasy. And in 2000, uh, David Wolverton, also known as Dave Farland under his pen name, started teaching the class. I was in that class, Dan Wells was in that class, Peter Alstrom was in that class. If you can point to a single moment in my career that was the most influential in me actually getting published, it was probably taking this class in uh, 2000. I had already written eight novels at that point. Um, I knew how to you know, put my proverbial shoulder to the wheel and write stories but I did not know how to refine them, and I did not know how to take them out and actually publish them. Dave taught me all of that. And publishing this eulogy for Robert Jordan. I didn't know Robert Jordan or his wife. I got a phone call one day asking if I would finish the series. Uh, before he went, before he passed away, he said, if I, if I don't make it, go find somebody. I'd written a eulogy for Robert Jordan on my website, and that's how she found out about me. At every single one of these moments and his big break, the one thing that is really unique to him and cannot be replicated by anybody else because it was a one-off circumstance in history, he made the decision that was true to himself instead of trying to be somebody else. When Brandon Sanderson wrote his eulogy for Robert Jordan, he didn't do it out of a sense of obligation or a, a drive to jump on the PR train or anything like that. He did it because he loved Robert Jordan's books, not just because they hugely influenced him as an author, but just as a reader, as a person, they had a massive impact on him. The Wheel of Time is such a definitive work in the canon of fantasy that Harriet McDougall would have been able to pick any author that she wanted. But the author she chose was Brandon Sanderson. Harriet chose Brandon not because he was the best writer around, but because she felt confident he would treat her husband's work with the level of respect that it deserved and bring the series to a satisfying conclusion. And she knew that by reading his eulogy. At that point, she didn't know who Brandon Sanderson was. She had never read any of his books. But because his eulogy has struck such a deep emotional connection with her, she knew that he was the author she wanted to finish The Wheel of Time. I'm not saying she read the eulogy and then she picked up the phone and called him right away. But at that point, if you read the interviews and what she actually says about how she made her decision, you could tell her mind was made up. Her reading Mistborn before she officially confirmed her decision, that was just a formality. It wasn't going to change her mind unless Mistborn turned out to be a total trash fire. Which of course it isn't because Mistborn is amazing and if you haven't read it, you definitely should. The eulogy he wrote was authentic and beautifully moving, which is why it connected so much with Harriet McDougall. So what does this mean? Well, I think the ultimate takeaway is this. The whole point of publishing is to find the right readers and match them to the right books. That used to be difficult because of all the complexities and challenges of logistics and print distribution. And now it is difficult because there are more books being published than ever before. And it is so hard to stand out from the noise. As readers, as people who appreciate art, I think we often feel drawn to the idea of genius and, and, and that, you know, artists should always be seeking to improve their craft because that means you can produce better art. And when you're at the beginning of your career, I think craft is one of those things that you have to work on the hardest because there are so many people trying to break through the noise and get to the next level and find readers. You have to really nail those basics around story, character, plot world building before you can even hope to distinguish yourself because readers have minimum expectations of quality and if they don't get it they're going to dnf that book and never read anything else you write ever again once you get past those early stages of your career i think craft becomes less and less important as you progress and this is true of any field by the way certainly that was true in accounting in education in professional services and consulting artists who are geniuses who get by without developing any of their other skills 
they're the exception, not the norm. Only way to build a sustainable readership like Sanderson has done is to write books that connect with readers. And I don't mean just connect on a superficial level. I mean connection on a deeper personal level. And that's really hard to do without authenticity. Being authentic is really hard. And I'm not just talking from a vulnerability perspective. It's because being authentic requires you to really do a lot of deep reflection on who you are as a person and try to synthesize all of that into a cohesive identity. Without that, I think it's going to be really hard to write something that is authentic to you. And what you end up with is a book that becomes a commodity. It's essentially substitutable with any other book from the genre in the best case scenario. And in the worst case scenario, Nobody even wants to read it because they could read so many other books that are more compelling because they are more authentic to who that author is. In conclusion, I don't think I can become Brandon Sanson. That means everybody else is right. It is just not possible to achieve his level of success because I am not Brandon Sanson. But I actually feel pretty good. And the reason for that comes from Sanson himself. Yes, write from the heart, but make sure you are reading widely. Read widely what you want to write but also read varying different genres and whatnot. I just found that if I tried to anticipate what people wanted, rather than writing what I wanted, um, I wrote terrible books. Okay. And when I, when I gave no care to what people wanted and only gave care to what I thought made a fantastic book, I did a good job. Because that made me realize, hey, it's okay if I can't write to market. Focus on what you have power over. You have power over whether you finish your stories. You have power over whether you're consistent. You have power over whether, you know, you are excited and interested in the stories you're creating. What matters is whether or not I can write a book that connects with somebody else on an emotional level. If I can convince them to click with a good cover, if I can convince them to read the sample chapters with a good blurb, if I can connect with them emotionally in those sample chapters to get them to buy, that is all it takes. I can stop stressing about whether or not I'm hitting the right tropes and focus instead on making sure every scene has an emotional impact on the reader. If I can connect with a reader emotionally and sustain that emotional connection all the way through to the book, then I know that person will get to the end and want to read more of my writing. The more I reflect on the importance of authenticity, the more I question whether writing to market is the most lasting and reliable way to commercial success. So while I have this figured out for my kids' books, I don't have it figured out for my prose novel yet. I literally have no idea why anybody would want to buy and read my fantasy novel over the millions of other fantasy novels out there. So uh, sales are going to go well. Not, not that I should even be thinking about sales right now because I need to finish doing the revisions and revisions are not going well. I just haven't done enough writing to figure out what my brand is as a fantasy author. Except I can't write progression fantasy to save my life and I also apparently have a thing against romance. So uh, yeah, when I tried the whole right to market thing, that really did not work.